So Dr. Larry Martin and his wife, Linda, now she's not with us tonight. She's got to take care of some things on the home front. But Dr. Martin, it is a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, this man has studied uh, history, church history. So uh, he fits in real good with, with uh, my wife and uh, the, the circles that they move around in there. And he's got some books for us to check out after we're done. You can look at that, The History of Azusa Street. And I tell you what, it is wonderful to be a Christian. It is even a bonus on top of that. The frosting on the cake that we get the power of the Holy Spirit thrown in with that too. So Dr. Martin, would you come and bring to us the word of the Lord tonight? It is a pleasure to have you at Maranatha Chapel. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Amen. Well, I count it an honor to be here with you guys tonight. I know that y'all are heroes that have paved the way for guys like me to come behind. And, and well, not too far behind some of you, but uh, still a little bit behind. And I appreciate you and I count it a pleasure to be here. Several months ago, uh, I was at uh, headquarters and Ruthie asked me if I could uh, speak for you guys. And I couldn't because I had a change of schedule, but I told her next time I'm in Springfield, I'll let you know. And uh, we're in here this week for the evangelist conference, starts tomorrow. And so I let her know I was coming and, uh, and uh, she was happy that we could come and be with you. And I'm happy to be here. I, I don't know what I'm going to tell you that you don't already know. Uh, probably uh, you know more than uh, I will ever know, but I'm going to do my best to share some things with you that might be a blessing to you tonight. Uh, Ruthie said that she had been doing Bible study. I understand that's the book of James. Uh, it's probably my favorite book in the New Testament, maybe besides John. I like the book of James. I like that part about faith without works is dead. Lots of, lots of people don't like that part. Luther wanted to leave James out of the canon of Scripture, but uh, I like the book of James. and uh, I'm glad that uh, you've been uh, digging around in James, a great place to look around. But uh, tonight we're going to take a break from James and we're going to look at uh, the origins of our Pentecostal faith, our Pentecostal heritage. Before I jump right into that, I want to uh, show you a little bit of what we're up to. Uh, we, we travel in the U.S. most of the time. I've been, a, uh, I've, I've been in the ministry for 55 years and uh, that's not as long as some of you guys, but it's quite a while. I started pretty young and uh, we mostly uh, do revivals uh, services in the U.S., but we do missions trips and do campaigns overseas. In fact, we just got home Friday night. We were in uh, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh for campaigns, and uh, this is a campaign in Bangladesh. We saw 382 people accept Christ for the first time, sign a commitment card, 382 souls saved. Uh, didn't see quite that many in Sri Lanka, but uh, we had quite a bit of opposition there. We had to move our venue three different times, but uh, God was still with us. We saw some people saved. We give thanks to God for that. And, and uh, this is a meeting we preached a few years ago in a place called Meta Kenya in Ethiopia. And uh, you can see this uh, guy on the front row is holding that little yellow book. That's uh, the book that we give people when they've uh, accepted Christ as their Savior, kind of like we used in a lot of our churches, the Now What book, and it's about what you do now that you're a Christian. And uh, we gave out all of the books that we had on Saturday night. Uh, usually on the campaign, Sunday night's the biggest service, and usually we see most people saved on Sunday, but we had, we had given out all the books that we had brought on Saturday night. We had given out 42,000 of those books to people that confessed they'd received Christ for the first time. 42,000 in the kingdom of God. And so we're excited about that. We're excited about everything the Lord lets us do. Uh, I love uh, history. I have all my life. And so I've spent a lot of time in, uh, in history. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Before we do, I'd like to ask you to pray for us. That's one of the main reasons I wanted to come. Because I figure if there's any prayer warriors anywhere, they've got to be you guys. And so I want to ask you to pray for my wife and I. Here's our prayer card. They're out on the table if you'd take one of these. And remember to pray for us. There is nothing you can do more important than prayer. Nothing you can do more important than prayer. And uh, wanted to talk to you about a website that we have called Pentecostal Gold. I don't know if any of you are on Pentecostal Gold or not. I don't know. We've got 
over 300 preachers on Pentecostal gold. There are 3,800 some sermons on Pentecostal gold of the greatest preachers that ever lived. I'm telling you literally the greatest preachers, Pentecostal preachers that ever lived. Men like uh, uh, Jack Cole and A.A. A. Allen and David Nunn and David Wilkerson and B.H. Clinton and you know all those names and of course Brother Trask and uh, uh, Brother Wood and Brother Zimmerman and Brother Carlson and just so many hundreds of preachers on here and if you have sermons on cassette or whatever that you've preached over the years and you'd like to see your sermons added to Pentecostal gold all you've got to do is let me know send those to me in fact while I'm here speaking to you in my hotel room uh, Charles Crabtree is preaching and I'm getting a sermon ready to go on Pentecostal gold brother Crabtree while we're while we're here I'm doing that almost almost every hour of the day working adding people to this website so if you if you'd like to be part of Pentecostal gold send me some sermons I'll tell you how to do that after we get through tonight John mentioned I had a couple books out there about history I've got a book about Charles Parham and there's one about William Seymour and Azusa Street but there's a couple more I'd like to just mention to you. This one's called Have We Lost Our Mind? And uh, it, it's, about, it's about the contradictions in today's Christianity. We've got people today that think you can be a Christian and it won't cost you anything. And we know that's a lie. If you're a real believer, it'll cost you everything. I tell people when I was growing up, my daddy wouldn't let me put a penny in a gumball machine because he said that was gambling. You were trying to get a trinket out with that penny and you couldn't gamble. And now we've got preachers that go to casinos and play the odds at the casinos. And it seems like maybe we've lost our mind. And that, that's what that book's about. And uh, this one's called The Good, the Bad, the Ugly, and the Hilarious. It's stories from my 55 years of preaching. Some of them, some of them will make you laugh out loud, I promise. Some of, you make, some of them make you cry. But every preacher that's ever preached can identify with the stories in this book because they, we've, all, we've all had the same thing. And... Uh, I know this is not a, a, a great need at Maranatha Village, but if you know anyone that has a problem, struggles with alcohol, this is a good little book that I wrote about common sense look at the believer, the Bible, and the bottle. And I think it answers a lot of questions about that. And that's enough of, that's enough of my commercial. Let's talk about the origins of the Pentecostal revival. I see. I got that up there. Let's see. So you probably know that the Pentecostal revival... Maybe I'll stay with the mic. Yeah, that's a better idea. The Pentecostal revival is the fastest growing movement in the history of the Christian church. 125 years ago, there were no Pentecostal people on the earth, not as we know Pentecost. And in that length of time, in that 125 years today, we number some 600, 650 million people, almost... Uh, Three quarters of a billion people claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic today. And what we're going to talk to you about tonight is the origins of that, how it got started. And uh, again, I, I know that some of you know some of these things, but we're going to do a refresher tonight. The Pentecostal revival started with this man, Charles F. Parham. And uh, I often say that, that God doesn't use denominations we thank God for the Assemblies of God and, and other great denominations. We thank God for institutions and educational facilities. But God doesn't use institutions or denominations. He uses people. God uses men and women to do his work. Now, he can use them through organizations. Of course he does in a, in a marvelous way. But God uses men. And the man that God used to birth the Pentecostal revival was this fellow, Charles F. Parham. And uh, Charles Parham came to Topeka, Kansas. He had, he had started his career in the ministry as a Methodist preacher. He didn't really fit into the Methodist church. And he traveled around as an independent holiness preacher for a while, and held tent revivals and different things, and finally ended up in Topeka, Kansas, and had a little bit of a history there, and uh, left Topeka and went north on a, on a, on a journey seeking more of God. He went to to the Christian Missionary Alliance in New York, and he went to, to Sanford, Maine, and he, he went to Chicago, where Moody School was. He went to Zion, Illinois, where John Alexander Dowie was. And he came back to Topeka and rented this old mansion, Stone's Mansion. Now, 
the people locally called it Stone's Folly because Erastus Stone that built this building was a real estate developer and he put a lot of money into it but they had a, a little minor recession during that period and he went broke and was not able to finish the house so the, it sat empty for a long time the people in town called it Stone's Folly it was a beautiful, beautiful place you can tell by looking at it it must have been, it must have been beautiful but on the inside it was prettier than the outside Every room in the house was decorated in a different kind of wood, like paneled out. One would be pecan, and one would be oak, and one would be ash. And, and literally, it wasn't made so much by carpenters as it was by cabinet makers. And they had beautiful stairwells, and it was just, uh, everything about it was elaborate. Until you got to the third floor, and that's where he ran out of money, and he didn't have the money to finish the third floor. But Charles Parham had the opportunity to rent this building, and he rented it and started a Bible college. Now, it wasn't a Bible college like CBC used to be here. It wasn't a Bible college where 18, 20-year-olds come and study. It was a, a place where veteran believers, some returning missionaries and gospel workers, gathered together to seek the Lord. That was their main purpose, was to seek the Lord. They only had one textbook. They didn't study science or history or math or or even theology or eschatology. They only studied the Bible. That's the only book they had. They studied the Bible, and they prayed 24 hours a day. Now, I know it's not possible for one person to pray 24 hours a day, but they had a schedule of prayer. I don't know if uh, my little pointer, this little pointer will work. Maybe it will. Yeah, they came up here in the highest part of this, the mansion, and, and uh, three or four of them at a time would come up there and pray for an hour or two, they would go down, and another group would come up, and they would pray. I know y'all know what I'm talking about. We used to do that in the church I grew up in. We was going to have revival. We'd have a 24-hour prayer call, and, and they'd ask everybody to volunteer to pray. And it was pretty easy to fill up 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock, but when it got at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, it got pretty sparse. People wanting to volunteer to pray. But they prayed 24 hours a day. It's kind of funny because there wasn't a stairwell going up to this part of the building. So they came up through here and walked across the roof and climbed in a window so they could uh, have the opportunity to pray. It would be all right in the summertime, but I guess it's pretty rough in the winter, especially if there's ice and snow up there. But they had a little pot belly stove in there to keep them warm. And they would pray 24 hours a day, study the Bible. That's all they were doing. They were hungry for God. Everybody say hungry. You know, the Bible says if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we'll be filled. And these people were hungry. Well, Charles Parham left them for a little while. He's going over to Kansas City to preach a meeting. And when he left, he told the students that he wanted them to study the Word of God and center in on the book of Acts and to see if they could find in the book of Acts any evidence that accompanied the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, he gave them this instruction. He said, don't study as a group. Don't come together as a class, but go aside individually and individually study the book of Acts and see what you can find. Now, he was gone about a week, it was right around Christmas time. He came back, he assembled the students together in their, in their classroom, asked them what they had discovered. And every student, there were some 40, 45 of them, every student had come to the same conclusion. In the book of Acts, when people were baptized in the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. And coming to that revelation, they began to teach and preach that if you have a biblical experience with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues. Now, none of them spoke in tongues, but they came to that belief that if you have a biblical experience, you will speak in tongues. Now, this is extremely important. Again, I might say this a hundred times tonight. I know y'all know this, but this is extremely important because they were not a manifestation looking for scriptural justification. We see that today. Crazy things happen. You know, people see angel feathers or something, and they'll go to the Bible and try to find their experience in the Bible. But these people went to the Bible and found the experience and then began to seek what they had found in the Bible. And they were praying continuously that God would give them a new Pentecost, a new apostolic outpouring. On January the 1st, 1901, this woman, Agnes Osmond, she had been a, a gospel worker for many years. Her sister had been a missionary to South America. In fact, died, a, a died on the mission field. But Agnes Osmond was praying that God would baptize her in the Holy Spirit right around midnight on January 
December the 31st, January 1st, right there at the break of the century. She asked Charles Parham to pray for her that she could receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, Parham hesitated at first because he didn't have that evidence of speaking in tongues, but he laid his hands on Agnes Osmond and prayed for her, and she started speaking in tongues. That moment, January 1, 1901, midnight, that moment was when the Pentecostal revival started. From that, it has spread literally around the world. But when she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the first person in modern times to receive the baptism while seeking the baptism with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. That doesn't mean other people hadn't spoken tongues. They had, but they didn't see that as the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, so Agnes Osmond received, and, and she spoke in tongues for four days. She couldn't speak in English. She couldn't even write in English. They'd put paper in front of her, and, and she'd write. It looked like chicken scratch to me, but, but it was an amazing thing. Uh, three days later, six, seven preachers from different denominations received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Charles Parham received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They evidence speaking in other tongues. Revival had broke out in Topeka, Kansas. It was amazing. Newspaper reporters came all the way from Chicago, from St. Louis, from Kansas City, to see what was happening with this tremendous revival. They thought, they really thought that it was going to take the world by storm. They had got a hold of the real thing. They'd got a hold of Pentecost. They thought it was going to be great, but it didn't happen just like they thought it was going to happen. Forgive me if I go forward and backwards because I'm not exactly sure. I've got hundreds of slides, and if I told you everything I know, we'd be here till tomorrow. So I, I eliminate some stuff along the way. But, but they had a very difficult time. Parham went over to Kansas City, tried to start a Bible school in Kansas City, and it flopped. He lost most of his followers. He went through a tough time where they didn't hardly even have food to eat. They were evicted out of that old mansion, and by the end of the year, the mansion burned to the ground. Some guy had rented it and put gambling and prostitution and stuff in there, and it, it, it caught on fire and burned to the ground. And, and worst of all, Parham had a little baby. It was his namesake, little Charles and that baby got sick. And they were faith healers. They didn't believe in doctors. They believed you ought to trust God. And his baby died. And it was a terrible blow to him. You, you can only imagine all these things going south on him at once. And now he loses his child. And, and it's hard for any parent to lose a child. But when you've trusted in God for healing and, and you've you're preached healing all over the country and now your baby dies, it's tough. But he never quit. He kept preaching and and uh, trying to hold meetings any place they'd let him. And he ended up in this place called El Dorado Springs, Missouri. And El Dorado Springs is one of those towns like Hot Springs, Arkansas, where they have natural mineral springs. We've got one in Oklahoma, not far from where we live, Sulphur, Oklahoma. And back in the day, before we had doctors like we have and medicine like we have, people thought if they could go to those mineral waters that it would bring healing to their body so they would camp out there they built all kinds of hotels around these mineral springs and people would come and and uh, so charles parham thought what a great place to have a meeting where all the sick people are that's you know that's the best place for a man that prays for the sick so he went to el dorado springs and set up meetings there and he was preaching and this woman mary arthur heard him preaching and she was a mess she was blind in one eye and, and almost blind in the other. Doctors had treated her and burned her eyes to where she couldn't stand the sun. She had to wear something over her eyes all the time. She had problems, intestinal plumbing problems. She's mess I mean, she was messed up. She didn't want to go to El Dorado Springs, but her husband made her. She had been two summers and stayed the whole summer and didn't do any good, and she was on her last leg, and she didn't see any reason to go back, but her husband insisted she go. And she heard Charles Parham preach, and after he preached, he invited people to come to the place where he was staying. He'd pray for them, and she went over there, and, and Charles Parham prayed for her, and then he sent her out to go back to where she was staying. And she had one of her grandchildren with her, and, and uh, you know how kids are. The kid ran off and left her, and she's on the street, and she's got something over her eyes because she can't stand the sunlight, and she's blind, and she can't see, and the kid's gone. And she's crying for the child, and the child don't answer. So she takes that off of her eyes. And when she did, she was completely healed. 2020 vision, totally, totally healed. Not only were her eyes healed, but her whole body was healed. I mean, it was like God did a complete overhaul for Mary Arthur. 
And Mary Arthur invited Charles Parham to come to her house in Galena, Kansas and hold meetings. And he did. And they went to the Methodist church there where they were members and held meetings in the Methodist church. And then that opened up the area to get a big old tent. And they had a big tent set up there in Galena. And they outgrew the tent. And they got two storefront buildings with the wall separated between them. that could seat over a thousand people. And, and revival came to Galena. In fact, everything that they had hoped would happen in Topeka in 1901 started happening now in El Dorado Springs. People started coming from everywhere. They, they baptized, I don't remember, almost 300 people in the Spring River right in the middle of the wintertime. One of them that got saved and got baptized in the, in the Spring River was Howard Goss, one of the founders of the Assemblies of God, got saved there in Galena in that revival. And they went from Galena over to Joplin, and 300, I think, people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Joplin. All in that four-state area there where Joplin and where Oklahoma and Kansas and Missouri, all this, Arkansas all comes together. They were, they were having great meetings. God was doing powerful things. Hundreds of people were now calling themselves apostolic faith. They didn't call themselves at that time Pentecostals. They called themselves apostolic faith because they believed that God was restoring the faith he gave to the apostles. And uh, then this guy started following Parham around. His name was Walter Euler. He had been healed, not, not in a Parham meeting, but through a Parham meeting, he had been healed. And uh, so back in that day, uh, when Parham would go from one town to the other, a whole group of people would just follow him from one town to the next. You know, most churches don't try to even have a revival today. But if you do have a revival, if you can get your own people to come, it's a miracle. When I was a kid growing up, one church had revival in town, and the other church in town would bring a whole group and come and support them, and they'd all follow each other around, revival to revival. Well, that's what they did there. And Walter Euler had a brother-in-law in Texas named H.H. H. Ayler. Now, I don't know if this is important. People don't pay attention to these things, but I, I had this kind of mind that I, I noticed stuff like this. So H.H. H. Euler, Ayler's wife... Is, is Walter Euler's sister. So an Euler married an Ayler. How many times in the history of the world would that happen? All she had to do is change the first vow in her name when she got married. She went from being an Euler to an Ayler. But anyway, they lived in a place called Orchard, Texas. And he was a man of influence and affluence. He was a railroad commissioner. And he invited Charles Parham to come to Orchard. Long story, can't go into all of it, but he, they did come down to Orchard, Texas, and God sent a revival. Somebody says that every family in town was saved but one. I don't know if that's exactly correct, but that's what I've read. Every family was saved but one. And it caused such a stir that people from Houston, which is quite a ways away at that time, now they've almost grown together, but that time it's trained right away. People in Houston heard about what was happening in Orchard, and this woman... Etta Calhoun got on the train in Houston and went out to Orchard and came there on a Sunday morning. A woman was preaching. If I stopped long enough to think about it, I'd tell you her name, but I'll skip it right now. A woman was preaching, and uh, Hall, Anna Hall, and, uh, and Etta Calhoun got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Y'all know who Etta Calhoun is? You know who Etta Calhoun is? She started the Women's Missionary. The WMCs, the Women's Missionary Council, that was started by Etta Calhoun that got her baptism of the Holy Ghost in that meeting in Orchard, Texas. Well, her pastor's name was W.F. Carruthers. What an interesting man Carruthers was. He was a lawyer. He didn't go to law school, but he studied and got his degree, I got his, passed the bar. And he was a judge in Houston, and he was a pastor. And he was the head and the founder of the Houston Real Estate Board. And he was a meteorologist, had his own little observatory. He was a, just a, he was quite a guy. When he heard what had happened to Etta Calhoun, he wanted more of God. That's that word I was said when we started, hungry. He was hungry for God. And so W.F. Carruthers got together some others, and they invited Charles Parham and his team uh, to come down to Houston. Now, up until now... Pentecost had been in the small towns, Joplin and Galena and way out a little place called uh, Kielville. That's where the first Pentecostal church was ever built, Pentecostal church building. It's still there today, Kielville, Kansas. Well, now they're going to the big city. They come down to Houston, 
they, they wore these Bible costumes that walked the streets. A man had gone to the Holy Land and, and brought back all of these costumes from the Holy Land and, and Parham bought them from him and he'd dress his workers in these costumes and they'd go down the street when they got everybody's attention, they'd invite them to revival. Well, you say, well, that's kind of hokey. Yeah, but they didn't have television or radio or internet or anything we got. They did the best they could. And wow, did they have a crowd. They filled up a place called Chalcedonia Hall and they filled up a place called Bryan Hall. All of his workers and they outgrew those places. They ended up building a big place to meet out on the edge of Houston in the suburb of Bruner, uh, Bruner Tabernacle. Out of that tabernacle, some of the great Assembly of God churches started. Uh, God was pouring out His Spirit. So now the revival had moved from, from Kansas and Oklahoma, Missouri. It's down in Houston, and, and it's growing. Now there are thousands of people that are calling themselves apostolic faith people. They had a Bible school. Parham loved to do Bible schools. They had a Bible school in Houston, this building. The building is no longer there. It's down on Rusk Street in Houston. And this, this Bible school was a changing moment, a paradigm shift in the Pentecostal movement because at that Bible school, this man, William J. Seymour, learned about Pentecost. Now, Seymour was the son of former slaves. He was born in Louisiana. Uh, I can't go into all the details of his life. He's just a, an incredible life. Raised in the worst poverty you can imagine. At one point, they did a, a survey of everything his family owned. And in an affidavit, his, his family's entire wealth was 65 cents. Everything they owned was worth 65 cents. They had one table, one chair, one bed, one mattress. They lived in a log cabin. They cooked outside. They had nothing. That's the way it was raised. He went through all kinds of, of uh, oppression, prejudice, racism overcame that all and he's in Houston and he learns about Pentecost and uh, he got an invitation to go out to Los Angeles. A lady there in Houston, Neely Terry had heard him preach and she told her pastor in, in Los Angeles, we need to have this man preach at our church. So they put some money together and, and, and uh, William Seymour went out to Los Angeles. Well, when he went to Los Angeles, Charles Parham goes to Zion, Illinois. Zion, Illinois is where John Alexander Dowie had started this utopian city. I don't know how much you know about Zion or want to know about Zion. but I mean, it was a, you couldn't buy pork there. You couldn't buy cigarettes or alcohol. Or, all the streets were named after the apostles. It was literally a utopian city. But Dowie was sick. He's getting dementia and he's losing control. And Parham felt like he was the next Elijah. He was going to go into Zion and he was going to take John Alexander Dowie's place. Well, he didn't get a really good reception in Zion. They, they kind of ran him out of town. But a lot of people did embrace Pentecost, people you've heard of. Uh, one of, one of Dowie's generals was a guy named John G. Lake. And John G. Lake em, embraced Pentecost. And F.F. F. Bosworth was one of Dowie's big men that embraced Pentecost. And, and uh, the Browns that went to New York, uh, Marie Burgess and Robert Brown, they, she received her Pentecost in Zion. So he's in Zion, Parham's in Zion preaching, and Seymour's gone to Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, there is a tremendous hunger for God. People are singing, are crying out to God. This man, Joseph Smale, and by the way, I'm going to give you all a test on this when I get through. Joseph Smale was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Los Angeles. He was so hungry for God. He took a sabbatical from his church. He wanted to visit the Holy Land. He went to the Holy Land, but he went back up and around to the United Kingdom. He was, a, in fact, a British man. But he wanted to meet Evan Roberts. There was a great revival going on in Wales. And, and Joseph Mayo was so hungry for God, he wanted to see God do in America what he was doing in Wales. And he wanted to meet Evan Roberts. And he met Evan Roberts and asked him, What do we do to have revival in America? And this is what Evan Roberts said. Go home and have church every day until God shows up. Isn't that a novel thought? We're living in a day where we see how little church we can have. Have church every day. Joseph Smale went back to L.A. and started having church twice every day. Every morning, every night, they had church at the First Baptist Church. And there was a revival beginning to burn at the First Baptist Church 
Now, you, you guys that have been pastors, you're going you're gonna to know this is true. One of the deacons came to the pastor and said, we want this revival to close. It's too loud, and we have too many strange people coming to our church. We want it to get back like it used to be. And they shut down the revival at the First Baptist Church. It could have been the vehicle God used to bring revival to Los Angeles, but one man and his wife got in the way. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Well, another man that was hungry for God was Frank Bartleman. Frank Bartleman sometimes was praying uh, all night long, all night long prayer meeting. He was fasting until he ruined his health just about. But he was so hungry for the Lord. And he was communicating with Evan Roberts, writing letters back and forth. And he was selling books about the Welsh revival and, and stirring hunger in the hearts of the people. But this couple right here, they're important. Richard and Ruth Asbury. They're not important because they're important. Because they're not, as far as the world's concerned. He was a janitor, custodian in a, in a bank. And she was a laundry woman, took in people's clothes for washing. They had a little house here on Bonnie Bray Street. But when William Seymour went to Los Angeles and preached in that church, he preached on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they throwed him out. They locked the door against him. And he joined in at a prayer meeting in this house. They were praying at Ruth and Richard Asbury's house. They were praying every day that God would send Pentecost to Los Angeles. And as they were praying and seeking God, different ones asking God for different things, one man named Edward Lee, a janitor at a bank in Los Angeles, asked God to touch his body and fill him with the Holy Ghost. They'd called a fast. They were going to fast 10 days. Any of y'all ever fasted? You know, if there's one word in the English language that's the wrong word, it's fast. Because there's nothing slower than a fast. You can fast 30 minutes and it seems like a day. But anyway, they were fasting for 10 days and Edward Lee got sick on the third day. Asked Seymour to pray for him. This was April the 9th of 1906. And when William Seymour prayed for Edward Lee, he started speaking in tongues. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost. They walked over to the house on Bonnie Bray Street. When they walked over there, they asked Edward Lee to testify. When he testified, he started speaking in tongues. And it was like a Holy Ghost bomb exploded in the house. People were shouting and dancing and running, falling in the floor, scared the kids to death. One woman never played the piano in her life, sat down to the piano and started playing the piano under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. She could play the piano the rest of her life. And she never had a lesson or never played it until God baptized her in the Holy Ghost. It, it was amazing. Well, the next day, word spread about this, and, and people came from everywhere. They were standing out in the street, and Seymour would stand on a porch and preach to them, and they realized that they couldn't hold a crowd, so they, they found this little building at 312 Azusa Street. Azusa Street was really only two blocks long, a dirt street. It wasn't really a street. Today, it's just an alley. But they found this old abandoned Methodist church. They could rent it for $6 a month. And they moved into this old church. It was a mess. The, the part the upstairs used to be up here. This used to be a church. And the, the entryway was here. Here were the doors. But they'd closed that off and they'd made apartments upstairs so that people were living up there. And down here, they called this the basement. And, and it had a low ceiling. Tall people couldn't stand up in it. They had to bend over. It didn't have any floor. I don't mean it didn't have carpet. I mean it didn't have any floor. It was just a dirt floor. The walls, that had a fire in there, and the walls were still charred from the fire. They'd, they'd housed wood and lumber and even stabled animals in there. They said it was full of moose flies and everything else. And they cleared out enough room to put in some chairs. They didn't have any pews. They, they got mixed match chairs and put boards across them without a back to them. And that was their... their chairs and, and they, they didn't have an altar so a man named Osterberg donated a redwood plank to them and they put that redwood plank at the front to be an altar and they didn't have a pulpit so they took two old shoe boxes wooden shoe boxes, crates set them one on top of each other and that's how they made their pulpit. Didn't have any musical instruments, didn't have air conditioner, didn't have fans, didn't have deodorant didn't have any of the things that we think is essential, but it didn't matter. Because when they moved in there, God moved in there with them. Amen. The glory of God came down. I mean, the glory of God came down. I, I could talk all night about it, but I'm, I'm trying to wind her down. But it was awesome. The Spirit of God blessed them. They had, an, they had a manifestation called 
the, the heavenly choir. And someone over here would sing in tongues, and then someone here would sing the same song. And someone over here would be singing the same song, and others would begin to sing, and they said they could hear the angels singing with them in the heavenly choir. Awesome, awesome. By the summer, by the summer of 1906, there were 1,200 people a night gathering at Azusa Street. This was a building 40 by 60. It wasn't hardly much bigger than from the end of that pew to the end of that pew and back. And they would crowd 700 people in the building, another 500 on the outside trying to get in because the glory of God was there. They had church three times a day. They had church at 10 o'clock, at noon, and at 7 o'clock. But the 10 o'clock service was always still going when the 12 o'clock service started. And the 12 o'clock service didn't end when the 7 o'clock service started. They were in church from 10 o'clock in the morning until after midnight every day, seven days a week. Week after week and month after month went on for years as the glory of God came down. People would come into Los Angeles when they'd come to the bus station, they'd feel God, excuse me, train station, there were no buses. Come to the train station, they'd feel God leading them to Azusa Street. Oh, it was awesome. It was awesome. They printed this newspaper, The Apostolic Faith, and, and people would, they would roll these up in bundles and mail them out and pray over them. And people would unroll the bundles and the glory of God would come on them before they even read it. And they would read the paper and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Here's some of the people that were there and went out into the world carrying the gospel everywhere. Don't have time to talk about all these wonderful people. This was the Azusa Street Credentials Committee. Just look at that picture for a little while. Look at that picture. Because I want to show you this. I clipped every one of these articles out of the newspaper off the microfilm in, in Los Angeles in the library. Look here, mob ready for Negroes, cowboys rope and hang Negro, mob gets another Negro, mob will take Negroes, Negro hang, Negro lynched, two Florida Negroes lynched by mob. Every one of these articles was from 1906 in the Los Angeles newspaper. Someone said that more people, more black people were lynched in 1906 than any other year in American history. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know. I have other stuff I could share with you. I just don't have time of how rampant racism was at that time. But while that was going on at Azusa Street, black men and white men, black women and white women prayed at the same altar and worshipped the same God. Frank Bartleman said, the blood of Jesus washed the color line away. Maybe that's the greatest miracle that took place at Azusa Street. There was no racism. There was no prejudice. The blood of Jesus washed the color line away. As the fire began to wane at Azusa Street, there were other places that became great centers for Pentecostal outpouring. One of them was Chicago, partly because of the closeness to uh, Zion, Illinois there. And lots of people in Chicago became powerful leaders. And this man's very important. Um, in fact, I'm working on his biography right now. But William H. Durham, uh, William H. Durham was a holiness man he was raised in a Baptist church in Kentucky, but he was never saved. He got saved in Minnesota and a group of holiness people, and he started out as a holiness evangelist. He heard about Azusa Street and went out to Azusa Street and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And uh, at that time, at that time, all Pentecostal people, virtually all Pentecostal people, <coughs> excuse me, believed that you had to be saved and then sanctified as a second work of God's grace. And then receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost as a third work of God's grace. Well, William Durham believed that sanctification was the second work of God's grace. But he said when he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he could no longer preach that sanctification was the second work of grace. And in 1914, 1910, I'm sorry. In 1910, he preached at the Stone Church in Chicago and preached a doctrine called the finished work of grace. And in that doctrine, he said, when you're saved, you're sanctified. And every day you grow in sanctification until you get to heaven, and then you're fully sanctified. Well, you know that's the doctrine of the Assemblies of God and almost all Pentecostals today. It's pretty normal today, but boy, when Durham preached that, it turned the Pentecostal world upside down. He preached that at Azusa Street, and a woman stuck him with her hat pin because he was, because he was preaching false doctrine. And they, they rejected it totally. Uh, William Durham died two years later. In fact, Charles Parham said he put a curse on him and made him die, which is kind of ridiculous. But he died two years later of tuberculosis. But when William Durham died, 1910, almost 100% of Pentecostals were second work of grace people. 
But when Durham died in 1912, half of the Pentecostal movement had embraced his teaching. That's pretty amazing. He was a, he was a wonderful man. Well, from, from Chicago, the Pentecostal message literally spread around the world. You can't say this was home or that was home. It spread everywhere. One more little story, and I'm going to close tonight and see if you have any questions you'd like to ask or comments. But if you have any questions about who the Antichrist is or questions about Joe Biden, Sean will answer those for you. I'll, I'll answer questions about Pentecostal history. Well, you know that the Assemblies of God met in Hot Springs, Arkansas. A group of, group of men starting down in the... Alabama had started a, a group and called it the Church of God in Christ, borrowed the name from, from Elder Mason, and they had a white group called the Church of God in Christ, and uh, Ian Bell was a large part of that and some other men, and they decided to call an assembly of, of true Pentecostal believers from across America, the Churches of God in Christ, and they come together in Hot Springs and founded what we know as the Assemblies of God. And uh, we know the rest of that, I guess, would say is history. But I want to tell you this story. You probably, some of you know this. Rachel Sizelove was at Azusa Street. She was part of that uh, Azusa Street Credentials Committee. Uh, she came back home. She lived in the Ozarks. She came back home, and here in Springfield, there was a place called White City. White City was an amusement park. And early day Pentecostals were against amusement parks. Early day Pentecostals were against everything. Modern day Pentecostals aren't against anything. <clears throat> I think it was better being against everything than it is not being against anything. But anyway, Rachel Sizelove, I don't know what all was going on at White City. It might have been a bad place. I don't know. Wasn't there. But Rachel Sizelove was praying against this place, praying against this amusement park. And while she was praying, she had a vision of a sparkling fountain. It started small right in the middle of that white city. It started small and it started growing and the fountain grew and got bigger and bigger until the waters from this sparkling fountain covered the whole earth. She saw that in the vision. She had no idea that that white city would close and that at the location of white city it 1445 Boonville Avenue, the Assemblies of God would build their headquarters and the sparkling fountain would literally go forth from that place to the whole world and continues, thank God, to go forth to the whole world today. So that's, that's kind of my synopsis of how we got here and all boils down to this. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Those people had revival because they were hungry and they sought God and they prayed. We can have revival in America today. I believe we can have a new Pentecost when God's people follow his word. Yeah. Amen. Well, I, I uh, successfully concluded in a little less than 45 minutes, so I will take... A few questions about these things I've talked about. I went very rapidly. I know that. If you have any question about it or comment about it, I, I'd love to welcome those before I turn it back to your chaplain. I see I've thoroughly confused you. Yes, sir. I wonder if the vision of the fountain is the reason that headquarters used to have a fountain at the corner. Uh, it was there I don't know the answer to that. You'll have to ask someone above my pay grade. I don't know the answer to that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it was. It was a. Yeah, that was part of the amusement park. Yeah, ball field. I refuse to comment on that. I refuse to comment on that. I think the devil did it. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There was a guy named Jethro. Starts with a W. I can't think of it. Uh, he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost maybe 20 years before the meeting at Topeka. But he did not recognize it as the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's what separates the experience at, at uh, Topeka because they were seeking the scriptural evidence when they received. Those guys, like, like uh, this man you're talking about, they believed that speaking in tongues was just another manifestation like shaking or falling on the ground. It was just, it was just another thing that God did for them. They didn't recognize it totally as the baptism of the Holy Spirit's evidence. Now, he did join the Assemblies of God and brought a lot of churches into the Assemblies of God. In a very, that's why Arkansas was always a strong district. It started out strong because he had already established a number of churches before the Assemblies of God was formed. Can you tell us a little bit more about the emphasis on world missions coming out of the revival? What impact did that have on emphasis for world missions? Well... Let me say this first that uh, we all know the Assemblies of God, the primary reason for founding was the missions. The main reason they wanted to come together, and not only just to speak the same thing, but they wanted to be able to unify in the effort to reach the lost of the world. But way back to Azusa Street, well, beyond, before Azusa Street, Charles Parham actually believed that speaking in tongues was going to be a gift for missionaries. He believed that missionaries be able to go to a foreign country and speak whatever language was in that country. That didn't prove to be true, but he believed that. When, they, when that revival got to Azusa Street, people, people receiving the baptisms at Azusa Street almost immediately were going forth to the mission field. You know, you, you want to be an Assemblies of God missionary today, you, you're going to go to Bible school for four years, and it'd love for you to go to seminary for three, and you're going to be a pastor or a youth pastor or something for two, and then you're going to itinerate for a year and a half. And 10, 12 years after you get signed up, you're going to go to the mission field. People went to the mission field 12 days after they felt the call. They would stand up in the meeting and say, I believe God's calling me to Africa. And somebody would say, I'll give you $50. And somebody would say, I'll give you $100. And they'd put the money in their pocket and get on the train and head for New York and get on a boat for the mission field. I mean, it was they were that serious about it. And... Uh, uh, some of them did a great work. Some of them unfortunate stories of people that died on the mission field almost as soon as they got there because of the lack of preparation and lack of knowledge. But, but the zeal was there. People literally went from Azusa Street to the whole world. It, the, the message spread from there to the whole world. One man didn't go to Azusa Street, but he was in New York City and met a group from Azusa Street. He was on their way to Africa. His name was Thomas Ball Barrett from Norway. He was a Methodist pastor in Norway. Thomas Ball Barrett met these Azusa Street people and was so hungry for God, he started communicating with the Azusa Street people and, and uh, reading one of their letters, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and started the Pentecostal movement in Norway. Uh, he went to A.A. A. Body in England, heard about uh, his experience, and A.A. Body, pastor in Sunderland, England, invited Barrett to come to England, and A.A. A. Body received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and revival started A.A. A. Body's church and a, a plumber uh, heard about uh, what was happening, uh, and he wanted some of that, so he went over to Sunderland and sought God and sought God for the baptism, didn't receive. He's going home and stopped at the vicarage. We'd call it the parsonage, stopped at the parsonage, and A.A. Body's wife prayed for him, and he got the baptism of the Holy Ghost at the parsonage. That was Smith Wigglesworth that took the message on around the world, so it just it just spread like wildfire once it started. It was, the, wind, the wind caught it, and it spread, and it, well, thank God it's still spreading today. Anybody else? Yeah. There was one guy named O'Reilly that went down there. It might have been he might have been one of those. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I preached at a church in, uh, I was in Poland, and I went to uh, Latvia, I think. And I preached in a church, had no clue, got there, found out the founder of that church had come to Azusa Street, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and brought the Pentecostal message to Latvia or Lithuania, one of those two countries. And it just, it was amazing how God 
used that revival and, and used a man like William Seymour who had very little education and, and uh, like I say, was raised in the worst kind of poverty and oppression. There was a group in his hometown called the Knights of the White Camellia, like the KKK that wore white robes and terrorized people. And it's a terrible, terrible way to grow up. And yet God used him and he had a, had a wonderful, generous, loving heart and didn't hold grudges. And I don't know. Do you know the answer to that? I think worldwide, the assemblies of God is about 12 million around the world. No, it's more, it's more than that. Yeah, it's more than that. Yeah, I, I was in Nigeria a few years ago, and they had 5 million in Nigeria, 5 million assembly of God people in Nigeria, and they were looking to double that in 10 years. So I don't know what they've done today, but that's just one country. And that's just the similarity of God, just one little piece of the puzzle. I mean, God's doing it through other groups and independent groups, and it's just this. We're, we're, we're a big piece of the puzzle, and thank God for that, but he's, he's bigger than us. It's, like I say, 650 million spirit-filled, baptized, spirit-empowered people. All right. Are we done? Yes, do you have a question? It was, I don't know the answer to that. It, it was in Finley, Ohio, and then they moved it here. Uh, a guy named uh, Leonard, Leonard, T.K. Leonard had it in Finley, Ohio, and uh, then they started the building. It just stored, they just tore that building down, yeah, where it moved to in here. Uh, I think there was a skip in between. Didn't it go to St. Louis? I think it might have been in St. Louis for a while, yeah, before it came here. I don't tell us. It was a former. It was a. It was a former saloon and brothel, in Findlay, Ohio, and he felt that if God can redeem people, He can redeem buildings for His glory. That's right. Well, a lot of those, you know, that meeting where Parham held the meetings in Houston, that was a dance hall. They'd just sweep it out and and have church there. Uh, an interesting thing I'll share with you, and I'm gonna really gonna quit. But uh, William Durham was a disciple of a fellow named A. S. Warrell. I don't know if y'all know who A. S. Warrell was. He was a Baptist preacher, and he was a scholar, a linguistic. He he was president of a number of colleges and uh, worked in colleges. And he went to Azusa Street and was really really moved by the Azusa Street revival. Well, A. S. Warrell published a Bible. Uh, around this period of time uh, called uh, Warrell's New Testament. The Seminary of God published it for a little while. But Warrell was literal in his translation of the Bible. It's the most literal translation you'll ever read. He never uses the word baptism in his Bible. Uh, he uses the word immerse. It was John the Immerser because that really is the correct translation, John the Immerser. And another thing, he never uses the word church the word church never comes into Warrell's Bible. He calls it the assembly because that's what the word was. The word was assembly. Well, A.S. Warrell died and left his Bible to William Durham. And William Durham, uh, E.N. Bale had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in William Durham's church. And E.N. Bale ended up with the printing plates for that Bible. That's why the Assemblies of God printed it for a while. But it is my belief, someday I'm going to write the story. It is my belief that the name Assemblies of God, as they say T.K. Leonard's the one that suggested the name, but I'm convinced that the name came from William Durham's translation of the Bible because he never used the word church. He only used the word assembly. Brother Sean, thank you for...